Welcome to Millennials Are Killing Capitalism. This is Jay. This is a slightly edited version of our December 5th live stream with film director, producer, screenwriter, rapper, and communist Boots Riley. He is the lead vocalist of the musical groups The Coup and Street Sweeper Social Club. He wrote and directed the film Sorry to Bother You and is the creator and director of the television series I'm a Virgo. We talked to Boots Riley about the recent labor upsurge, including the wave of strikes and increasing militancy among workers in the United States. We briefly discussed United Auto Workers' call for a ceasefire in the war on Palestine and establishment of a divestment and just transition working group. We also discussed navigating the capitalist film and television series as a communist and possibilities for organizing among creatives. Boots also answers some questions about making anti-capitalist art, including some behind-the-scenes insights from I'm a Virgo. We want to shout out Boots Riley for joining us for this discussion and definitely recommend I'm a Virgo if people haven't watched it yet. I also want to say that there's some really special content that we released in the month of December on our YouTube channel, including this conversation. It also includes a conversation with Steven Salada and our conversation on Kwesi Balagoon with several comrades of his and movement elders, including Ashanti Alston, David Gilbert, Dequi Kioni Siddiqui, Matt Meyer, Meg Starr, and Bulal Sunni Ali. If you haven't checked that out yet, make sure you do at youtube.com slash at M-A-K capitalism, all one word. This will be our final episode released in 2023. We have a ton of other stuff we recorded in 2023 that's already being edited for release in 2024. This year we released 67 audio episodes, 26 live streams, and our content was listened to or watched over 640,000 times. We're proud of that. We're also proud that our programs are still entirely dependent upon regular folks like yourself who listen and watch the work we put out. Today is the last day of 2023, so it's the last day to support us for the year, and that would be much appreciated. But also, we hope many of you who have not become patrons of the show yet will do so in 2024. We want to profusely thank everyone who supported us in 2023 for making the show possible for another year, our sixth. As always, you can support us at patreon.com slash millennials are killing capitalism. Welcome to the stage, Boots Riley. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, thanks for having me. Just one correction. Uh, at SF, San Francisco University is probably very different than San Francisco State University, which is where I went. And they are, the faculty there is currently on strike as part of uh, Cal State Systems are having a rolling strike right now. So Yeah, I appreciate the clarification and the mention of that. Uh, one of our comrades who was recently on the show, Cesar Che Rodriguez, uh, had just mentioned that the other day. He's faculty at SF State, and um, we have multiple of guests on the show that are a part of that strike right now. So, um, you know, solidarity to all of them. So, yeah, I mean, speaking on that same topic, you know, you've been kind of one of the loudest voices describing what we're seeing in the U.S. labor movement in the past couple of years as a strike wave. What do you think makes this, you know, strike wave and labor upsurge special in your mind? Um, You know, I agree in sort of the there's this increased interest in unionization. There's more strikes going on. It can be just about wages and benefits. Right. Which was good. We support that. Mm -hmm. But but you seem to think that there's something a little more special in the organizing and militancy you're seeing. So I just wanted to start there. Yeah, well. We're seeing it as not only an outgrowth of people wanting material change, which is, I think, like the basis of what what, what right. most folks listening to this are fighting for, but not only wanting individual material change, but we're seeing it as an outgrowth of the last bunch of decades of movements trying to figure out how do we do something, you know? So, you know, I got radicalized in the 80s at a time when basically what radical movements were, aside from, you know, a few things I luckily came of age and became involved in, was a spectacle. It was uh, protesting a thing, right? Saying, we don't like this. We want it to go away. We want things to be different. And, And I believe that was an outgrowth of how things had been for the past couple decades since the new left. 
And a lot of frustration came out of that going into like the WTO protests in the late 90s, or was that 99 maybe? And then, you know, the anti-Iraq war protests, which, you know, found millions of people in the street saying, hell no, we don't want any war. And and I definitely had been part of things in which, you know, folks would be like, hey, well, wh- what is this going to do? You know, even through the 90s, like, <laughs> you know, OK, we're going to go protest police brutality. What is it going to do? And I think for lack of a better answer, we gave a wrong answer, which was we don't know, but let your voice be heard. Right. Letting your voice be heard is is. You know, and I, I won't say it's wrong, but it obfuscates how power works, right? Because, yes, we need our voice to be heard. We need to communicate with each other and tell each other things that we think. But the idea of, quote unquote, speaking truth to power, as if that power cares what the truth is, right? As if the more voices saying something, we can shame folks into it. And, and I think that's and, and again, I'm leaving out some really good exceptions to that, right? But that was kind of what things were were seen as. And I think we started to see a change in the idea of what power responds to. That That is not a new thing. It was just people becoming clearer on how capitalism works, right? And so, for instance, we saw a difference between, you know, you go forward to the Occupy movement and you had Occupy Wall Street, which was very different than what was going on in Occupy Oakland, for the most part, from everything that I can tell. I was only involved in Occupy Oakland, but I knew people involved in Occupy Wall Street. And Occupy Wall Street was like, hey, we're going to occupy this place and bring attention to the fact that it's the 99% against the 1%. And there are all these travesties happening. Now, that was a step toward closer to a class analysis. Right. It had nothing to do with function or anything like that. But it, And we saw that happening, going on all over the country. But in Oakland, what happened was actual people that were, were, were uh, radicals said, Okay, we see that going on. We're going to start something here. And so it was started, and I wasn't part of that, but it was started with the intent of radicalizing that whole thing, which is why you ended up having uh, stuff like a call for a general strike, which wasn't a true general strike, but 50,000 people came out, shut down the ports. We started seeing this connection of the idea of withholding labor to larger societal change. And so that started growing. And so, you know, you fast forward, skipping over a lot of stuff, a lot of people, you know, organizing fast food and changing what that actually means and what you'd have to do. Like even to actually organize fast food, you'd have to break Taft-Hartley laws to actually do it, where there were some forces organizing fast food that knew that they were never going to break the Taft-Hartley laws and just saw it as sort of an organizing thing to raise awareness so that they could elect people to change certain policies or whatever. But there were other more militant folks like IWW connected things happening in the Midwest around that sandwich place where they started saying, okay, no, we got to be able to have solidarity strikes, which is breaking the Taft-Hartley laws. So you start seeing some of these things turn into better understanding of how power works under capitalism. Now, fast forward to 2020, and during Black Lives Matter, there were whole like restaurants of workers walking out saying, with only the goal of, we don't want to serve police for free. Stop that, you know? And that happened in several places around the Midwest. So that is something that, is not only using that power, but broadcasting that power to other people, right? We saw things like the Boeing workers who, when they went on strike, one of their demands was that it was at a time when the idea was that uh, respirators were needed, that they wanted to stop making airplane engines and make respirators for people. 
you know, so these are those sorts of things. You have other work stoppages, such as teachers in Chicago, L.A. and Oakland, which not only, you know, did they strike for wages, but they struck and won common goods things. So in Oakland, with the common goods wins that they got during the strike, by staying out on strike was uh, services for homeless kids. We have a lot of homeless kids, homeless people in Oakland and a lot of, you know, homeless kids. So services for them and services for their families as well. Mm -hmm. But separately from that, the teachers won the ability for parents and teachers to have a democratic say over what large swaths of the budget are. And they did that in L.A. as well. And I believe Chicago. So we're seeing labor look to changing policy and the way things are. You can look to the WGA strike as well with that, right? You know, so often what's told to us is that technology just, you know, is inevitable, like the way Mm -hmm. that it works. You know, the way that technology works is inevitable. We have no say over it. Hey, here goes these computers and they're going to look at everything you do and keep track of it. You can complain about it, you know, and that's about it. And I think, you know, a lot of people put themselves on the line, not only for, you know, for their own economic benefit, which would be actually, you know, that is a militant thing, but expanding from there and saying, you know, we don't like that this is happening in the world. And, you know, we're maybe the only ones that can do something about it. Mm -hmm. And with that strike, not only that, you saw solidarity from Teamsters, solidarity from IATSE, solidarity from all sorts of other factors that didn't exist. The folks that I hadn't wasn't in this industry in 2007, but everybody that was there were like, this wasn't happening back then, that, right. uh, that other unions were crossing picket lines, this and that. That was nowhere in sight. Now, people kind of had different feelings about it, like, hey, come on, you guys are striking. We should do, you know, and there's all sorts of talks between, you know, there there were some writers that led talks between writers, directors, and IATSE members. And just to understand what, you know, each side was fighting for and declare some unity in uh, both fights because IATSE is going to have something coming up this next year, right? Mm -hmm. So we're seeing that radical unity happening. And it's interesting, it's coming up just out of necessity, right? Like people trying to figure out, well, what's the most effective way to fight? Not even out of the, you know, and it's leading folks to these ideas that have to do with working class unity. Right on. IATSE is like, is that like production assistance and things like that? Like, no, it's uh, it's the the crew of film crew. crew. Yeah. Film crew. Um, Okay. Yeah. Film crew. It's also stage crew, you know, all that kind of stuff. Right on. So, this, you know, continuing on this, you know, I want to also think about Palestine right now. You know, I know that this is something that you've been involved in in different ways over the years. And obviously, you know, there's there's a lot of calls, a lot of organizing going on. You know, you've been involved in some, you know, some statements and things like that. I'm sure you've been doing a lot more, you know, behind the scenes and stuff like that as well. You know, the other day, United Auto Workers, which obviously just got done with its own very significant strike, made the step of calling for a ceasefire, which is a pretty big deal to have a union of that kind of size and membership, you know, making that kind of call. What do you think about that? Further than that, they they have, I may state it wrong, but made a working committee to investigate divestment, boycott divestment and... um, they use some other words, so I'm going to say it wrong, but to investigate that and what their connection is with that and made the connection to what they did during South African apartheid. So, yeah. So I was just going to ask, like, what do you think are some ways as we think about getting more effective in how we organize, thinking about the things that labor can do in turn, unions can do in terms of this kind of struggle? What are some ways you think about you know, that people and also people who are not in unions, right, but are looking to take yeah. meaningful action that can 
maybe combat or cause some kind of material impact on whether it's the U.S. military industrial complex, whether it's Biden, whether it's, you know, other forces that are pushing this war? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, there's what could happen and there's where we're at, right? And and I, I'm not claiming to know exactly where we're at, but I know that there's a big difference with that, right? Obviously, if, for instance, you know, every port said we're not letting anything in and out from Israel and the workers that were manufacturing bombs stopped doing, you know, there all of that is within the imagination. And that is something that were the working class organized, that would be a way to put a big damper on on that uh, slaughter, you know, and sometimes, uh, obviously, in my work, I talk about things like general strikes, and things like that. Sometimes on social media, it kind of gets thrown out there like a slogan, right? right? General strike now. Well, like how, you know, what does that actually mean? You know, so we have to be working on these things. We have to be working on regular wage struggles, regular on the job, you know, conditions, with a radical purview, with a radical vision being talked about as we organize these things so that when situations like this happen, we are ready. Now, sometimes situations like this are some of the things that get workers more radicalized. But even with that, you need radicals around to help organize it. Even like, you know, a lot of people would agree that one of the most militant unions around is the ILWU. Right. The longshoremen, specifically in the Bay Area, they were pivotal during South African apartheid. You know, they've shut down things for police brutality campaigns, things like that. But even they, I know a lot of them. Matter of fact, E-Rock, who used to be the other rapper in the coup, is a longshoreman. So through him, I know people and through other work, you know, even they are like, why do you keep asking us to do stuff? Right. Why aren't you organizing these other workers to do stuff? Right. Hmm. And that some of that is actually real. They have a point. But some of that has to do with the fact that even in the most militant union there is, there still has to be organizing and daily work that happens. You're not going to just all of a sudden be like, this thing needs to happen. Let me make a good case to you about it. It's involving people in struggles and and getting them to see their power and getting them to see themselves as an agent of change, right? And that's that's a big step. And I think we have a huge opportunity right now to meld that with this, you know, struggle against atrocities going on in, in Gaza. And I think what's happening is you know, so many people are getting burnt out from just calling for it to end. And you you start feeling helpless. And that's, that's kind of what happens, right? Because as much as I know how power works, you know, you do give it a shot. Like maybe they'll, <laughs> maybe the U.S. will tell Israel to, to stop if we could, you know, like we're on the verge of a, ge- of a full-blown genocide. Let's try that. Okay, fine. That blows people out because you end up, you know, begging people to do stuff and you end up also broadcasting a different view of how things work, right? Like I was talking about. But everybody's looking for a way to actually have some say in it, to actually have some some change. And, and I think this new labor movement that's starting is a thing that people can can look to as a possibility. If people can see how it could work, they might be more interested in using uh, the withholding of labor for radical goals. Do you think that there's any kind of, um, and I don't ask this because our podcast is called Millennials Are Killing Capitalism, because actually that's just sort of a joke based on all those headlines years ago mm. that say millennials are killing cars or whatever. But mm. do you think there's any kind of generational aspect to kind of some of the shift around labor? Because, you know, there's there's new unions. Sometimes there's independent unions that are cropping up. Like I'm thinking about like Starbucks, for example, mm-hmm. or Amazon, you know, and then 
you now though see like with UAW, right? That like they had a a, a major shift in leadership, you know, yeah. a year or so ago. And so I'm curious what you think about the dynamics of that as far as you're seeing. Like, is there is it that like you say, I mean, I know there's a lot of folks that came up and were involved in Occupy, were involved in Black Lives Matter. And as you kind of said, like they realize like we've done a lot of different types of organizing and protest and so on, but we haven't seen any kind of material change related to these things in yeah. terms of producing the world we want to see. So I'm curious what you think about that aspect of it. Yeah, well, one, the Red Scare did a job. And even the way that folks that were radicals approached things, right? Red Scare happened, no social media, everything is being told to you that this is the way the world thinks. So even radicals in the 60s approached it in the sense that thinking that everybody agreed with mainstream media as far as radical ideas. So even when it was being put out, it was kind of, it was put out in a very specific way that avoided saying certain things, avoided putting forward class struggle in certain senses. But even to the point where myself, even being in my 20s, I have family members that are like, you sure you want to call yourself a communist? But my everyday world, even in the 80s, I never really encountered anti-communist. I only encountered mm -hmm. people being like, really? But what? how does that get me paid? You know, that sort of thing, right? right? Um, it never was, you know, people, actually people knew, you know, when I was a teenager, what people knew was, okay, communism, that's the thing that the government doesn't like. Maybe it's good, you know, that sort of thing, right? <laughs> right. Um, you know, so I never... I never had any inhibitions around that just due to my experiences. But older folks kind of had a different experience with that. So and so and I think the further we get away from that. Right. So even then, you know, people would be like, oh, but there's the Soviet Union. They've got bread lines. You know, what's that? You know, that sort of thing. The further right. we get away from that constant barrage that we were getting, like. Two years before I joined a communist party, my favorite movie was Red Dawn. And I had arguments with my father about like, hey, what if the Russians do invade? Right. We got to be ready. Right. So those things were, you know, out there. And so I, I think that's part of it. The further we get away from that to that economically, Things have been getting really fucked up and, you know, they repackaged and sold the 60s to us in various forms, right? As, you know, whether it's the civil rights movement, whether it's, you know, hippies, whether it's, right? And, and that kind of got sold to us as here's the way you do things. Right? And so I think it caused people to question a little bit more because there, there was this certain kind of rebellion that was sold to us. So I think people are a little bit more open, you know, due to reaction to that. But also, you know, it's it's not just generational. It's not just being farther away from that. There are radicals that have been organized. There sure. are radicals that have been pushing things out there that have been doing things. And I think that's kind of where we are. I think a lot of those radicals aren't in parties aren't in larger organizations and we see, and then I think some of the problems with where we are as a result of that sort of situation. But, but yeah, I definitely, I think younger people are more radical, but I think it's, you can talk about actual material reasons. I, I would say though also, and this has been like the standpoint in all of my art from the beginning is that if you talk about, radical ideas, if you talk about what communism actually means, if you talk about what socialism means, most people agree with it. Right. <laughs> like the, the movie, Sorry to Bother You, most people didn't have a problem with the politics. They had a problem with the horse dicks or whatever, or <laughs> didn't like the structure of it, you know, that sort of thing. But very few people... You, it's just the basic shit. So I think that what we're also seeing is that boomer generation, generation X, just wouldn't use the same words. 
and may, maybe believes in these things, but doesn't believe in the viability of the movements that could get to those things. And, and I think just because the difference in the number, there's more acceptance that these are places in a movement we could get to. You know, with, with the strike wave thing that was happening, there's old uh, radical longshoreman retired who's still kind of very involved. And I was telling them about, hey, there's, there's a strike wave going on. And he hadn't heard anything about it. Mm-hmm. And it was like, mystifying to him that it was happening, that there were all these thousands of strikes happening, you know, and he couldn't put his finger on how did it get from this point to that point, right? And, Interesting. You know, and and I think some of that has to do with media. One, one reason I like uh, paydayreport.com is that they track a lot of these strikes. Uh, there's also, I think there's a Columbia university site that does that. But the idea that we know that strikes are going on is something that is what makes these sorts of movements seem more possible to us. Right on. You had a recent interview with Alex Press for Jacobin, and you talked about like, you know, how many filters there are in trying to get radical politics into Hollywood through the writing process. You were kind of talking about the writer strike and then you know, that it would radicalize writers, but that, you know, you didn't know whether that would necessarily translate to more radical writing because, you know, it's difficult to get radical writing through. And if you want your job and you're thinking just about your career, then you're probably not going to focus on writing the more radical stuff. And so your quote was, if your main thing is trying to make a living from writing, then you're not going to get those politics through. And it, it made me think when... And I, maybe that's you, cynical. And please try. But I think the point that I'm, I'm making is that for me, art has always been second, right? It's been, you know, unfortunately at times, uh, also business has been second or third or <laughs> fourth or whatever. And, and I haven't made smart decisions in those cases, uh, but they're the only, the decisions that kept me going, right? And I think it's also what makes me inventive because my goal is not to get a thing done. My goal is to get this thing done, right? Because there's certain reasons and all of that. And I think a lot of artists are already insecure. A lot of humans are. And so if you've got a lot of people telling you that you're fucking things up, If you fight for this one thing, it starts being hard to figure out what you do fight for, what you don't fight for. And if you don't have a movement to fall back on, if you don't have people to look to or, or, you know, anything like that, then you lose yourself. And especially if it's like, I got to stay in this, I got to stay in this game, you'll lose it very quickly you know, right away. And, and it'll be like this series of little chips at your thing. And, and you know what? That can happen, whether it's about politics, whether it's about some sort of particular art style or anything like that. Because as an artist, you do want to listen to what other people think. You know, you don't, I don't at least, want to just create something in a vacuum. And so I am actually very collaborative. I think having something that I look to that's bigger than myself is the thing that is able to keep me doing it. Um, But it doesn't have to be politics. There's this joke. What do you call a bass player without a girlfriend? Homeless, right? (laughs) Because, and, and there's a lot of truth to that in the sense that, you know, somebody wants to make their music so much they're not focusing on the business of it sometimes. They're not focusing on whether this is going to take them to this other place. They want to make their music. In film, that doesn't exist as much because the writers that are being hired often have gone to film school or they've gone to some sort of creative writing program. And when they were in that film school or creative writing program, they were promising their parents that they were going to make a living. And look, we don't only see this in writing. We see this in movement politics as well. The, Absolutely. The, the reason why so many people get jobs with nonprofits that have constricting politics are because 
They have some radical ideas often, but how do I get a job with these radical ideas? Right. Yeah. And, and, um, that was my experience. Yeah. (laughs) It was. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, getting out of college and like, I started working in the nonprofit, you know, world because it was like, oh, I can get a job. I can get benefits, you know, and this is what my family was telling me to do, you know. And so it took me 15 years to really just realize how small this had made my politics, you know, and and yeah. try to try to figure out a way to do something different, you know. But it's yeah, it's not easy. I mean, I guess one of the questions that I wanted to ask about that, you know, is like I think that you know, when we interviewed you about Sorry to Bother You, our question was like, how did this movie get made? And you had a story about, you know, like how you did it and how you kind of, you know, got support for it among people and and got it together and pushed it through. And, you know, now you have this other series, I'm a Virgo, which is excellent. If people haven't watched it, please do. I think it's great. And, and this came out on Amazon, right? So you also had to uh, again, I mean, and it, that wouldn't matter. I mean, any of these, you know, studios or big corporations that are going to put out your work, yeah, you're 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 working within a capitalist system. So I'm not trying to say that in a specific mm-hmm. thing with them, but I'm just saying like you are navigating getting these politics, and in some ways, I mean, there we'll talk about this, I think, a little bit later, but um, there's certain aspects where I'm a Virgo. The, at certain points, I think the politics are even more explicit or more explicitly stated rather maybe but i think that you know you're not just in these movies and in this this series it's not just a politics of complaint or a politics of criticism of capitalism and because we see that in other places but it's also really thinking about making art that grapples with how do we actually build power and and respond to these things and so yeah, I'm just interested in your own experiences with trying to keep your politics in command of those projects, like, you know, navigating that and any thing that you would offer to younger creatives that are inspired to do something similar, you know? Yeah. Okay. You know, I think for me, some of the more directness with the politics in it was actually an artistic choice, almost like, you know, because I'm also yeah. always looking at how to, uh, I, I discovered a long time ago, like I didn't think until maybe my third album that I was an artist. Like before that, I was just like, I'm doing this thing to do that. But I discovered that I need to be passionately intertwined with the art of something. I need to feel like I'm progressing art to feel connected to it. That's just what, you know, uh, you know, I, I've come up in it. That's that's how I feel connected to it aesthetically. And I feel like if I feel connected to it, then that's my best way to know that other people will feel connected to it. That's my only way that I can really know, right? So that leads me to figuring out how to push boundaries artistically, right? And the thing you're not supposed to do is have a character turn to the camera and say, this is the way it is. Right. Right. And, and, you know, I definitely, I don't think I, I don't know. I I feel like that's not what I do in any of my other art. You know, I I think it's, there's something else to it. And with my grandmother having run theater companies here and then me having been involved in theater again like black box theater is like personally i see that and it makes me feel like being a kid that's bored in this thing and people arguing with each other right Right. and um so i like went toward the thing i'm not supposed to do and that was more of an artistic thing like how do i do that and it's not just doing it but make it feel like something how do i like repulse people and make them also come back in right Mm -hmm. like not repulse but make you take you out of things like you are what hello you're watching something and now you're going to get back into it right and so you know i wanted to figure out if i could do that so to me that felt exciting because it felt like a risk it felt scary because of that as well and so that's where some of that like directly saying it kind of came from it also came from a need of Like, I need the story to move along. And I think if I move the story along and just have these things happen, 
but people don't understand why Jones would call for a general strike. You know, they don't understand why. They just understand that she did it because that's what radicals do. And I didn't want that, right? And so uh, that's where that kind of power came from, like from that need. I want to continue on this point for just a minute because I, you know, I was at a screening of Sorry to Bother You in 2018 and it was in Philly here and somebody asked you a question about I can't remember, but it, but it came down to this this discussion of like show don't tell, right? Which is like this thing. I think it comes out of the Iowa Writers Workshop or whatever. Mm. And I remember the person in the crowd saying, "Do you know that the CIA like you know spent <laughs> a bunch of money like funding that concept, yeah. right?" And I think you your response was, "Well, you know, just because they funded it, we don't necessarily know why. They might have thought that it was a very effective mode of getting their message across." To, to to do sort of, for folks who don't know, it means you like show through the story rather than tell like coming out and explicitly saying it. And yet this is an example, I think, in some ways within uh, of these little vignettes within the series where there is just like, no, I'm going to stop and tell you. And I agree. I mean, I think, I you know, I had written in the question initially that I, you know, I showed them to my teenager because I was like, this is like TikTok in some ways. Like these are like Mm -hmm. these, but they're very captivating, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so these short, you know, three, five minute segments where Jones, you know, really lays something out very well. Who's for folks who don't know, you know, she's an organizer, rent strikes and so on. And, you know, another one is the hero has a, has a rant about, all art is propaganda, right? Which, of course, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and so I love these little segments, uh, but I, I, it made me think back to that screening and you kind of yeah. was sorry to bother you thinking about, you know, showing rather than telling. And then here you're, you're kind of playing with that a little bit. Yeah, I don't remember the question or the answer sure. to it. But I, I would say, uh, one, we know that certain styles were pushed by the CIA, you know, we know that a lot of stuff that came out of the MoMA in the 50s was stuff that they funded and pushed Jackson Pollock. We know that Paris Review was ran by two CIA agents that were in so deep that they didn't even know each other were CIA agents. And the idea behind that, they even published some radicals in Paris Review. And in the other, there were some other magazines around the world that people uh, were involved in that came out of that same collective and funded by the CIA. And their whole thing was, we can let all of these ideas out. And you could talk about, you know, these ideas in relationship to the United States, because they didn't feel like the movement was big enough to do anything. But you can't talk about, you can't support any revolutions that actually happened. (laughs) Right. And that was the thing. And so it made it seem, you know, passe for writers and, you know, like it's not because of the Red Scares, because it's passe for writers in the 50s and 60s to celebrate anything that happened in the Soviet Union or in China or anything like that was, you know, that that was the goal. Right. So they do did push certain styles and certain things because and that was a big win for them to have a group of intellectuals basically start taking on the mode that anytime there's a revolution everything about it is bad, right? And that's kind of, that we see that to this day, actually, right now, you know? Um, and, yeah, sure. and, you know, to where if you say something good about any state that the U.S. is against, then that means you're supporting anything bad that they've ever done, right? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, we could talk about it in the context of Palestine, right? Of like, you know, it, you you can you can yeah. call for a ceasefire, but as soon as you start to say, I actually support them to resist, then you know, yeah. it's you support this and that and this and that, right? And uh, yeah, absolutely. So the second part of that question earlier though was like just thoughts for folks who are trying to navigate this right. of like they they are radicals, they're in an organization, et cetera, but they're interested in making art and trying to get it made. And, you know, you've been through this. For, I mean, mm. obviously, yeah. musically before the film stuff, too. So, well, here's the thing. When I started rapping, I knew I wasn't good. I started, you know, I only started rapping because I had a friend who I was 
trying to get to come to police brutality rallies and stuff. And he was a rapper. And I lied to him. I said, there's going to be a lot of people there and you can rap. You can rap something against the police. And, you know, he was like, I'm only rapping if you're going to be my hype man. And I was Julius T. Poet. And I started being his hype man and asking him how he raps, how he thinks of stuff. Right. And um, I realized, like, wow, I could do a lot with it. And I realized I wasn't good. And I knew the battles that I would have. I knew the the silent gatekeepers that would close the gates at certain points. And I knew that the thing I had to do was be good. Not just be okay. I had to get good and having self criticism, all of that. So, one, you got to have something that's undeniable. And how do you do that? And it took me a while. Like, I even, you know, some people like my first album, it's something that's hard for me to listen to, right? But even to get to that point was a, a lot of work. So, and what does good mean? Who knows? But, um, the way that you hone yourself is through repetition. And that repetition can't be you looking at something and just, you know, maybe sending it to a friend or whatever, because also those friends aren't reading your script, you know, like a lot of them aren't. They're busy, they're doing stuff. I think one thing that you got to do is figure out ways to see your work in action. And this, what I'm calling for here is, one, you got to start just, you got, you got to start making little videos, you know, um, writing short scenes, writing things. And, and look, nobody wants to look at them. Let's be honest. So you got to figure out what is that exciting thing that's going to be on this video that's going to make it work. You're going to end up developing a style. And this is even if you're already writing for someone, you know, or whatever, you got a job in a, writer's room or whatever. I think you need repetition of having people react to your work to see what's working, what's good. And for me, like what I used to do is I would take my music. Well, obviously we would also hand it out to people in cars and see what, how they reacted or drive up with the music playing in a friend system with the car and see if anybody react. But I also go to like uh, whatever the best buy was of the time and put right. my music in and go in the other aisle and see if anybody reacted at all. Like I, all sorts of ways to, you got to get in there. You got the reason why I started to bother you was able to do what it did is because I was new to film, but I wasn't new to art and I had a process of it, you know, 10 pages into Sorry to Bother You, I was bugging people, like read, having friends read the script, all that kind of stuff. And because I was so used to that sort of thing. And, you know, like 30 pages in, I somehow got Oliver Stone's people to read the script and write things. And that was my first thing. Some One of his assistants wrote, oh, he's good at dialogue, you know, and I was like, what? I'm good at dialogue? So, um... <laughs> So you got to start with that. Two, you got to know what you want to happen with that work. Is your goal just enlightenment? Is your goal just to be like, I'm letting you see this? What do you want it to cause people to do? Right? Who knows whether that, but that's how I can gauge whether it's successful. I want people to, to join organizations, join campaigns. I want to set up a worldview that makes people want to make that choice, mm -hmm. right? That's my goal. And so that's how I'm thinking about my work and whether it's effective and it gives all, all these things, right? And, um, you know, and that's, that's how I can critique it as well. So you have to have that because that is going to give you a thing that everybody doesn't have. There's going to be a lot of people writing to kind of catch up right now, which is some of it because they're inspired by the way the world is right now. They're inspired by the movements and that is good. And that's natural. Um, you have people that at least got a little bit more radical, like during the uh, minor strikes of the eighties, you had pop stars like Billy Bragg that got politicized by going out to the strikes and then started writing 
slightly more radical stuff, right? So you had that, and that's honest, right? But then you're also going to have people to be like, producers being like, this is the kind of thing we need. This is where people are at. Can you write me something like this, right? And it's going to ring hollow. It's also going to be that something like this is going to have all these other, you know, bourgeois ideas in it. It's going to, you know, you had that happening in the 70s, you know, like, you know, a radical was represented by Meathead in All in the Family or something like that. Or, you know, the plenty of good times characters where somebody's supposed to be like they're in the Panthers. It's just this cartoon, right? Um, Mm -hmm. So, you know, one, establish the fact that you're going to make art no matter what, and you're going to figure out how to get it out there. Even if you have to take your video on tour with you and a friend in a car and you set up gigs all around the country. If you figure out that you're going to do some version of it, then the things that you're doing end up becoming a train that people have to choose to get on or let pass by. And that makes it something different. That mm-hmm. that builds an excitement about it. But you're not even, you know, you, you've got to figure out how people are reacting to your stuff. It's a little hard doing it just on social media because you know, people press like or whatever, or they don't, and you don't know what people are doing. You got to get where you can see people's faces, see how it's happening. And that takes another level of organizing an effort just on, on that, that side of it. This is not, obviously, I should have prefaced this by saying, I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. <laughs> this is just, you know. You have some experience what, though, for sure. What, yeah. What, what I'm saying, but you know, There's new ways people can do it. So you make your thing something that you're going to make happen, whether it's a $1,000 version of it, a $5,000 version of it, a hundred thousand. And and for Sorry to Bother You, I had all of those ready. Like, Sorry to Bother You, uh, I I think probably the version that came out in McSweeney's, we had like a hundred Equisapiens coming down the street, flipping over cars and, you know, using bat smashing in windows and all that kind of stuff. And it got to, you know, and that was probably like a, you know, $15 million version at least probably. And, uh, you know, and it was like boots, we're only going to get three or 4 million for this. What do, what do we do? And then I was like, okay, he gets hit on the head and we only see it through a slip. Right. And that saved all that money. Right. But but the point is, is that you figuring out that you're going to do it. And I think if you are connected to radical movements, not just have radical ideas. So that's one thing I would say is connect yourself to a radical movement. Get involved in that. See how these things are doing. See how I de- what makes people want to do things. You know, a lot of what my work has been influenced by is, you know, doing door to door campaigns with radical ideas or selling a radical newspaper or things like that. And, you know, and I have a difference with some people that are my friends that make art where it's like anger, anger, anger. You got blah, 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 blah. Obviously, maybe there's a place for that. But what I realized even before all that music came out was that people didn't mobilize for that. They mobilized when they thought there was a way to win. Right. Now, I'm not saying you can't have anger fused with that, but if it's just anger, it feels like it, there's no optimism in it and there's no way to win. And so your art will be affected by being involved with actual winnable campaigns with a radical viewpoint. Uh, with a radical vision. And you'll understand those. You'll start learning those things through your interactions with people. And so that changes not just how effective it is, but it changes how people are affected in the moment when they see your art and it becomes something new. And so then you can do a $1,000 version of your movie, a $5,000 version of your movie. And 
and have it connect with people and bring it to people and learn how to do those things. And I think we need more of that because politics aside, all the big rappers and artists that we know right now, they're there because of all the people selling their music out of their trunks, all the people that are just, you know, going to the open mics, doing that. And I think with film, we don't necessarily have that in that same way. It's very isolated. And there could be a movement made with film, but it needs to be more connected to communities. And, and so I think more your question was, once you get to the level where you've got funding in this big way and you're fighting over these things. Now, l- let's say this, in every movie, every piece of art that has that amount of money, you know, you're talking, you know, a million dollars or more or something like that, you know, you're probably going to have people that have money that have opinions about it. And you're going to have to deal with that. And some of those opinions have nothing to do necessarily with the politics directly, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that is part of, you know, part of the the working together and figuring it out. And for me, you know, having done music for a long time, having in the past, uh, you said I'm an organizer, I'm not you know, in the past I have been, but, you know, having had that experience, you learn how to, you know, and I'm not the best at it, but you still learn certain things about how to work with people, how to give people, you know, some agency and things and and have them buy into your thing. Right. Cause that, you know, I, I probably used this last time I was talking, it was like stone soup, right. You get everybody to put their thing in and and you're making something together, right? Mm -hmm. Still, somebody is leading it. You're the leader, but you're getting people to put things in. And and if you've made, if you didn't just pop up out of nowhere, I don't know how you could pop up out of nowhere and have something that does all the things you want it to do. But if you're not just popping up, maybe it can happen. But if you're not just popping up out of nowhere, you've built you by now built a bunch of stuff up to where whoever's getting involved with you knows the deal. Yeah. And I mean, I think one of the, one of my favorite things in both sorry to bother you and I'm a Virgo is the organizers in, you know, whether that's Jones or squeeze, you know, and these, you know, I mean, you can tell that, you know, I mean, I, yeah, I didn't mean to call you a current organizer, but I know that you've been in parties and I know that you've organized, you have those experiences, right? And these are real characters that you're able to, you know, I'm sure they're composites and whatnot, but you're drawing on experiences as well as, you know, your own, I'm sure, you know, ideas of what you want to get across in terms of things that don't work so well and things that you think, you know, have a better chance of making change. And so I appreciate that yeah. in in both pieces. Um, I'm going to pull up, we have a couple of audience questions, so I'm going to pull up a couple of them. Okay. First of all, shout out to Eric for supporting the channel. This question was about organizing. So thinking about cultural workers, artists, and craft people effectively organizing, is there any instances of artists organizing that you can historically point to? Let's see, this might be connected movements that have been successful. I mean, yeah, go ahead. I mean, I kind of know where you're going to go, I think. Yeah, I'm, I'm not the best person to answer that question because I, I, I'm also looking for those answers. But obviously, we just had an example. WGA, SAG, you know, striking, doing these things. But in order to even create SAG, that was a specific thing that happened in and of itself. Because you had this larger communist movement happening, you had folks like Charlie Chaplin, who, you know, was influenced by that. And I don't remember whether he was in the Communist Party or not, but he definitely was a communist. And, you know, then they did a strike, but obviously they weren't able to, it wouldn't have worked in that case if it wasn't these bigger actors that had been seen themselves as connected to this larger movement that was going on around the world and told the studios they weren't going to uh, to do it. So I, w- I would say this, like, had there not been these revolutions going on around the world in, this, in the 20s in the United States there, according to Seeing Red, the documentary, uh, there were a million card-carrying communists 
in the 20s. And that was the milieu that all of that happened in, right? So I would say one general answer is that that movements becoming more radical in general across the working class are going to open up spaces for cultural workers to uh, be able to do things like that. So for instance, right now, if we talked about an effective musicians union, a recording artist union or something like that, you'd need strategically, you need all these big artists to withhold their releases. It would have to be the ones that are the biggest ones coming out. And there'd have to be, enough, that. it wouldn't be as simple as that. But that's only going to happen once we're at this other level. And that has to do with just the, you know, just the way the industry is made. But I would say WGA and SAG are some examples of cultural workers, and I think you're asking about cultural workers organizing for their own sustenance, right? Because there are, there's thousands of them with cultural workers organizing to help out other campaigns. Uh, but so, yeah. But I, I, yeah. WGA and SAG, I think, are right now, this strike and the gains that have gotten, at least for the WGA, I think will inspire a lot of artists to figure out how yeah. to do it. Right on. And I mean, there's also this effort I saw recently, and there's been a couple of efforts around this, but around like streaming services. And I think this is an interesting thing within like the music world of like, you know, Spotify and Tidal. It's like, I don't, you know, I know that the the amount of money that artists get from this is like, you know, basically next to nothing. And um, so I know that there's efforts underway in that. Yeah. And I mean, I guess the question is, do you think there's something specific about artists that makes them harder to to get into organizations? Well, well and... we're, we're petty bourgeois, right? Not necessarily in our tastes or, you know, who we want to align with, but just the material situation is one in which people... And so I'm not... I'm saying that, like, in the sense that people are, like, thought of as their own private contractors, right? And they're not necessarily always working with other ones. And the places where artists are working with other artists are the ones that are getting unionized. Even the VFX mm -hmm. artists right now are um, unionizing. And um, But, you know, people are in their own individual places, you know, and, and so I, I think that's, that's a big part of it, which is why there would have to be new things figured out because all those same problems have existed for like even, you know, we talked about longshoremen. Longshoremen were thought of as not being able to be organized because it was high turnover. People could get work for one day and get fired than somebody else. And then there's different docks, different piers all over the place. And, you know, they, you know, the, the ship could pull into a different place, you know, all of that was happening. So it was thought of as that same way. And they figured out how to do it. You know, it had to be more militant, you know. You had a similar thing, similar problem with Lyft and Uber drivers, where people are like, well, how would you ever know? Right. And so it ma makes it hard. But uh, I think an example, though, of how you can do it with it getting more militant. Um, and this is just one little fight. Taxi drivers in Paris didn't want Lyft or Uber to, to be able to get a license right. to do it. And they said, OK, after this date, no Uber is driving because I think they only had Uber. No Uber is driving. And everybody was wondering how they were going to do it. And they they were effective. They won whatever that was. I don't know what's happened since then, but what they did was they just looked for any car where there was an adult in the back seat and nobody in the passenger seat. And they with their cabs, they went and blocked the car, reached in the car, reached in and grabbed the keys and threw it out, even if it was on the freeway. Right. And uh, famously, Courtney Love was one of the people in the back of one of those cars. And uh, apparently, you know, this is what a driver told me, so I don't know. But apparently tweeted out that she was now having to walk on the side of the freeway because this happened to her. <laughs> wow. Um so somebody else asked about, you know, cooperatives, cooperation, communalist movement, gave the example of Cooperation Jackson in Mississippi, and whether you could see potential for that kind of thinking in the realm of the arts. Um, 
Well, so right now there are a number of folks, partly because of the struggle that happened with the strike, trying to figure out how to do collective studios, uh, collective film studios, to be clear. And I'm not, as a matter of fact, I actually am, am on the board of one that Lily Wachowski is doing. And there's different setups, uh, uh, you know, to do it. I think it could be cool. I don't think it's an answer for, you know, the the, the whole way the industry is set up, uh, mm-hmm. you know, and the questions remain about um, you still have to get funding, you know, and I think it's basically a way for pay to be a little bit more fair. And uh, I think that can be good, but I don't think that's, the answer, you know, um, in the same way that I don't think, you know, getting a group of people to move to a quote unquote better neighborhood helps solve the problems of the neighborhood. Right. Right. And so we still have to look at the big ones, but, but cooperation Jackson, you know, folks that I really respect. And I think there's something that folks are doing which is about making a model, but I think what is, and it's good for that to be happening, but, you know, making a prefigurative model or whatever, it's good for that to be happening. But I I don't even know if that's, if the question is whether or not it can work or not. I I think, you know, there are people that do that, but I don't, when people are saying, could that even work? I don't necessarily think most of them are asking that in good faith. You know, I think uh, we know we, it can work. And I think the difference is how do we fight to transform all of society? And you know, that, that question exists even when you have a revolution in one country, right? Right. Because the rest of the, you know, capitalist world is fighting to defeat that country and, you know, and nobody else is free. So, you know, so, so those are, I think it's something that if it can help a group of folks, then I look at it as, as a reform, that's good for now, but, you know, let's make sure that we're still putting in effort into organizing to get rid of the whole system. Right on. I wanted to ask you one more I'm a Virgo question, which is, you know, in it, there's like a little bit of a, there's a, there's a tactical or maybe it's even a strategic kind of debate dialogue that's going on between different characters in the film. And, you know, there's the example of Jones, who's really looking at, you know, collective organizing, rent strikes, labor strikes, general strikes, really trying to to organize mass groups of people towards these kind of politics. And then there's also this this dialogue around like kind of secretive stuff like, you know, there's the whole thing with, you know, Cootie, the main character, like being kind of kept secret for his whole, you know, childhood and growing up. And and then there's this this critique obviously of like doing these actions that may even have a material idea behind them, but that can be kind of quickly undone and, um, and criminalized as well. And so I was just interested in kind of some of the things that you're thinking through there. I mean, obviously it's kind of stated Mm -hmm. through the, the film, but if just, if you had any commentary on that. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah, it, it's pretty much right there. It's more that, you know, we, and that in a certain way was just talking about this sort of great, quote unquote, great man idea, right? Of like mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. doing this this thing that is symbolic and that maybe has some limited material change and connecting that to the same idea of reforming capitalism. Right. And 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 how those are very, are similar ideas, but one gets the uh, cover of seem aesthetically being revolutionary. Right. For for some, this is like, OK, whatever. We talked about that enough in our lives. But, you know, the thing is, we're often talking and not so much now. So I'll say this, but people in my generation often talking about Che and Fidel um, without realizing that they wouldn't have been able to have a revolution. They didn't just come in on the boat and make that revolution because that, that happened, but there were general strikes happening. There was organizing happening by the, the working class of Cuba that was able to destabilize the ruling class there. And 
that Cuba wouldn't have been ready for revolution, nor would they have been able to have one without all of that happening. And often that's looked at as this totally different thing that was happening. But if you're look, stepping back and looking at history, it's part of why it all happened, right? Yeah, right on. Appreciate that. Um, just lifting this up to folks, uh, you know, boot set it, join an organization, join campaigns. Um, and obviously, that's one of the reasons that you said that you make art. It's one of the reasons that we do what we do as well. And so hope folks that are listening to this get involved in something like that. And yeah, I mean... I want to thank you so much for taking this time talking to us. Definitely want to encourage people to go watch. I'm a Virgo. If you have not, go watch. Sorry to bother you again. Congratulations on the accolades and everything that it is getting. It is well-deserved. Um, do you know at all if there's going to be a season two? I mean, there's like some speculation out there. And I was curious. Um, we don't know. And and actually, you know, some of the answers to that last question of what that discussion was actually about uh, actually had to do with stuff at the that was supposed to be at the end of the season at the end of the that got cut out and kicked to a theoretical season two but you know we don't know yet so yeah. um, I I am making other stuff no matter what I'm I'm I'll be shooting stuff next year so yeah I heard. Uh, I think pick you're going to do a pick a bigger weapon uh, project, possibly. No, there is something that is inspired by a song. Okay, on okay, pick okay. a bigger weapon. So I'll say okay, that. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. okay, okay, okay. All right, cool. Well, thank you everybody for coming through. And boots, thank you so much. I know that you're extremely busy, and we really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us and uh, you know just share your work and your thoughts with us. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank All you. Right. Cool. All right. Peace.
Thank you.